Hi, this is Kate, and this is the second video for week 9 of Math 23. So we talked a little bit about topology, finite topology, and open ball topology. Well, there's something a bit special about open ball topology in general. So let's take a look. Now, if we're looking at the website diagram, note that the sequence 654, 654, 54, 54, 54, and continues repeating 54 forever, it converges to both 4 and to 5. There's no such thing as being within epsilon of 5 or 4 because there are only particular states. There's no half difference between 5 and 4. There's no 4.5. There's no 4.75. The only elements of this set are 4 and 5 and 4 and 5. So what's interesting is both 4, 5, 6 and 4, 5 are open sets, but 4 by itself, 5 by itself, 4, 6 by itself, and 5, 6 by itself are not. Note that this can't happen in Rn. That's probably what you were already thinking about and what I was hinting about uh, just a moment ago. If the sequence uh, in Rn converges to A and the same sequence also converges to B, we can prove that A equals B. And you might be wondering why that is. Why are we able to do that in Rn but not able to do that with the finite topology example? Now, the open ball topological space is Hausdorff. And what that means is that we can be given any two distinct points and we can find open sets around those distinct points that don't intersect with each other. So there's a set that A belongs to, there's a set that B belongs to, and the intersection of those sets is the empty set. And in a Hausdorff space, the limit of a sequence is unique. Moving on a little bit, let's talk about infinite sequences and in series of vectors and matrices. So this is really combining everything we did in module two, two with some of the concepts that we did in module one. Now first up, we need something that can be made less than epsilon. And for vectors, the familiar idea and notion of length is perfectly fine. And the infinite triangle inequality, which is going to be your proof 9.2, actually states that the length of an infinite series of vectors is less than or equal to the sum of their lengths. And again, we'll be going over that in class. We basically define the length of a matrix in a very similar way to defining the length of a vector. If we have an n by m by n matrix A, it's an element of R. Note that that's m times n up here. So that's, uh, you can imagine that it's the number of entries in the matrix. So we can view it as a vector and define its length so with a similar notation as the square root of the sum of the squares of all its entries. So this definition has the following useful properties. The length of the resultant vector when a matrix A acts on a vector B is going to be less than or equal to the length of the matrix A times the length of the vector B. Similarly, if you have two different matrices, A and B, the length of their product, the, sum of, the square root of the sum of the squares of their product is going to be less than or equal to the length of the matrix A times the length of the matrix B. Now let's combine series with matrices when we talk about the exponential of a matrix. Yeah, that's taking E and raising it to a matrix power. We're going to get into what use this is in some of our sample problems, but it's pretty interesting to think about. So let's define it first. The exponential of AT, note that A is a matrix, A is a square matrix, is defined very familiarly. This looks a lot like the power series representation for e to the x, but instead of x, we have at instead. So we have the matrix A raised to the rth power times t to the r over r factorial, where r goes from 0 to infinity. And what the exponential of a matrix really is, is sort of like an analogous operation to the exponential that you regularly know, except instead of working with numbers, taking a real number and returning a real number, it, it takes a matrix as its input and it returns another matrix. So it is analogous to the exponential function itself. It just acts on matrices. So it's interesting to note the close connection here between what we know the exponential function to look like as a power series representation and what the matrix exponential function looks like. So if we want to denote the length of what the exponential of a matrix is, then that's going to be less than or equal to the sum of, well, everything in here, but instead of taking uh, a 
to the r times t to the r, we have the length of a times t all raised to the r. Now note that it doesn't make sense for us to talk about the length of t, that's a variable, the length of r, that's an index, so really when we discuss length, that's what's going on there. And we'll be talking more about various interpretations and their different uses uh, to take the exponential of a matrix. Let's take a look at the next page. You may be wondering how you may ever calculate the exponential of a matrix, so here's what you need to do. Note that if we have a matrix that's a diagonal matrix, D, then D times T is just going to multiply the entries on the diagonal by T. And the exponential of AT is first the identity matrix plus BT, CT, that's DT, plus one half, and then we have another diagonal matrix where the entries are BT squared and CT quantity squared. And note that what's happening is we're creating the power series for E to the BT and E to the CT along the entries that are on that main diagonal. You might be wondering, like, what is D? Well, D is, if there's a basis of eigenvectors for A, then A is equal to P, D, P inverse. You're very familiar with that. So if we're raising A to a really high power, that's the equivalent of taking P times D to that power times P inverse. And so the exponential of AT is going to be P times the exponential of DT, P inverse. And taking the exponential of DT, as you may have expected, is frequently much easier. Replacing D by a conformal matrix C, which is AI plus BJ, where J squared is equal to negative times the identity matrix, negative 1 times the identity matrix. And the exponential of CT is equal to the exponential of AIT times the exponential of BJT. That can be expressed in terms of sine t and cosine t. And last but not least, it's also important to note that if A can be represented as BI plus N, that should sound familiar as well, with n squared equal to zero, then the exponential of at is going to be equal to the exponential of bt times the exponential of nt, which is equal to the exponential of bt times the identity matrix plus nt. So there are a lot of options as far as how to express the exponential of a matrix, all depending on how that matrix behaves and whether it has a basis of eigenvectors, and if it does, then there's one way to express it, and if it doesn't, then there's another way to express it. Let's take a look at solving systems of linear differential equations, mi mixing the ideas of matrices and derivatives together. Note that our notation here shows that we put a dot over a quantity to denote its time derivative. So this x dot means dx dt, y dot means dy dt. So the solution to the differential equation x dot equals kx is the function some constant times e to the kt. And suppose there's more than one variable. For example, maybe dx dt is equal to x plus y and dy dt is equal to negative 2x plus 4y. And you'll definitely hear Paul saying x dot and y dot, and I will in office hours in section as well, but just know that that's what we're talking about when we say x dot and y dot. So if we set v equal to the vector x, y, then this pair of equations becomes, well, dv dt is going to equal our matrix A here times v. So we basically strip the coefficients away from the system of equations and put them into A. And the solution ends up being the same as in the single variable case where v itself is e to the at times some constant vector v naught. And how do we know that? Well, we start out with this definition of the exponential of a matrix. We then take the derivative with respect to time. Note that all we have to do is apply the power rule to every single term, so r comes down and the power is now r minus 1. If we set s equal to r minus 1, we then substitute in everywhere here to get this. We factor out 1a, and we realize that what we're left with in here is the exponential of at. So we have a times e to the at. And that's really important, because what this has now told us is that we started out here by taking the derivative of e to the at, and we got back a e to the at. And that's exactly what we were looking for. We were looking for something whose derivative was some constant 
in this case a matrix, times itself. So what's interesting is that v dot is equal to the derivative with respect to time of the exponential function of a t times v naught, which is equal to a times the exponential function of a t times v naught, which is just equal to a v. So we've basically found the solution to our differential equation. We'll do some examples with this in class as well as in section, and you'll get some good practice taking advantage of this.